Hello Internet! Today we have this MSI 4090 that came in for repair due to random crashing and no display. The weapon of choice for this repair will be this brand new multimeter, which was provided by a company who was brave enough to send their equipment to me in exchange for a review, so it better be good. First thing to do is to make sure that we don't have any of the 12 volts shorted, so let's see how well this meter will handle this task. In auto mode, checking resistances and finding no short, we get a pass. However, when measuring data lines, which have to be performed in a diode mode, the meter measures the resistance instead. This is very much expected because we're not measuring the diode, but the semiconductor circuit, so there's nothing wrong here. With the basic measurements out of the way, quick visual inspection reveals that we have some sort of damage here. This type of damage is usually a sign of what to expect under the hood. Or it could be the fact that the MSI is the most delicious 4090 money can buy. So they took a bite out of it. Who knows? Right now, let's power the card and see what it does. Just over 2 amps. Looks good, so let's plug this bad boy into the motherboard and don't forget to support. Otherwise your GPU will end up on my bench. Powered on. And... Nothing. No image. Let's take that HDMI cable out, plug it into the motherboard so that we can get an image coming from the Intel CPU. And run a memory test, which says we have a problem with F0. And now that we're armed with that knowledge, let's take this thing apart and have a look inside. There. This is where F0 is located. Before we attempt any repairs, let's quickly jump around with our new meter and see what values we get and where. Who knows? We might see something weird. But no, nothing weird, from what I can tell. Everything's looking good, so we can proceed with the repair. Now, because the chip is so close to the corner of the GPU, and we have a sign of the damage on the PCI Express lock, my experience tells me that the chip is not to blame, but the core. I suspect we may have rip pads under the core, so to make sure that this repair is interesting, I will lift both the core and this chip, re them both, fix any rip pads if there are any, and hopefully that helps.
reball is done, and before I power the board, I want to compare this multimeter with a Fluke 289. I think this comparison is very fair, and you will see why. Let's power both units at the same time and see how long it takes to boot. Clearly our new device booted much faster. Now I want to utilize the trend function, perhaps the only function which compelled me to buy Fluke in the first place. The only problem I'm facing with Fluke is that it does not provide real-time trend data, which can be used to identify odd charging and discharging behavior specifically on 12 volt rails. So instead what Fluke can do is to record the measurement after which you hit stop, you can then analyze how resistances has changed over time. This meter on the other hand can do it in real time. All I have to do is to change the monitoring mode and I see both resistance values as numbers and I see trend chart at the same time. Now why am I comparing the two? And the reason is simple. Fluke is stuck in the past. Display is terrible, slow in response, features are outdated because Fluke does not innovate much in the last 20 years. Why it costs so much I have no idea. So does that mean this meter is better? It's a yes and a no. Yes, because it has a lot of features, but all of its greatness is kicked to the ground by the size of the meter itself. It is simply too small for what it does. Small form factor has limited the engineers to program countless features of this device to be operated just by five buttons. This is a terrible idea because it is difficult to operate, easily confusing and time consuming unless you get used to it. Basically, first impression is kind of negative, but in the long term, it may actually be okay. I really wish this unit was larger, with a rotating dial like Fluke, and more buttons for easier access to many of its useful functions. But it is what it is. I'm not a very big fan of minimalist design, and for that reason, I can't stand iPhone, and the idea that you can do everything with just one button. Either way, Voltages on the board are also looking good, so let's power it on and see if it posts. There we have it. To satisfy yours and my own curiosity, I want to check all of the core phases to make sure that they all look the same, to rule out any potential issues with power delivery. For that, we're going to need an oscilloscope. And lucky me, they also sent me this portable mini oscilloscope, which I think is kind of cute. I won't be going into too much detail about the scope inner workings because well, scope is a scope and it does what scope does. Just like Spider-Man does what the Spider-Man does, if you know what I mean. And this scope isn't much different. It allowed me to check all the phases and confirm that there were no issues, as I could have confirmed using my old scope. But what sets this scope apart is its price and portability. While price may be tempting, portability is going to be its enemy number one. To be specific, you can't connect this probe wire directly to the scope. You have to use an adapter, which I will later show you is going to be its fatal flaw. Device size and the minimalist design, with only five vaguely explained buttons and the tilt push trigger button on the top of the right corner that I always forget exists, making the basic navigation is very difficult. This is a scope, not a portable Tetris console. There are so many parameters that I need to change, and changing them with just 5 buttons is confusing and time-consuming nightmare. Once you get used to it, it's not bad, so it's best if you take it with you, sit down on the couch and spend some quality time playing around, and get familiar with the controls before you actually need to use it. In my opinion, oscilloscope should have knobs for X and Y and trigger, but the size of this oscilloscope makes it impossible, so they have to reserve using buttons instead. And as a result, everything is also very small on the screen. Active selection, for example, is not very clear, so it's very hard to tell what will change when you press whatever button. Are you moving the trigger or shifting the axis? No idea. Hard to say, at least for me. Maybe my eyes aren't as good as they used to be, I don't know. But otherwise not bad for the price. I can't complain. Especially given the fact that this was given to me for free. <laughs> For those who have a little bit more money to burn, they also sent me a hybrid consisting of both multimeter and the oscilloscope all in one. 
I won't be going into too much detail about this unit because it's equally as good and equally as bad as the other two, with a couple of exceptions. The negative part of this unit is that it does not have a trend for the multimeter. Not sure why that is. Maybe because it's implemented into the oscilloscope mode. I don't know. Uh, but the positive thing is that the oscilloscope mode on this device is noticeably better. Because of the arrows and more buttons to play with, getting your scope to obey you is much easier than on the smaller brother. Both of them are equally equipped with the signal generator, so we can play around and see how they respond. And also, bigger unit uses standard probe connector, and it has two channels. Two channels is very useful for determining the firing order for multi-phase controllers. If for any reason you have to disable one or more phases, you want to know in which order they fire up, and this scope will help you to do just that. At this point, there's not much else to say about this scope meter signal generator, except that it suffers the same problem as the rest of the devices. It is simply too small. Too much good packed into such a small factor will never be a good thing. It will be affordable and possibly even popular among the hobbyists, but for professional use, I'd stick to the old scope any day. Either way, let's put this card back together as quick as we took it apart, power it on and run some tests. That's it for this repair and the demo of these well-made diagnostic tools, which I wish were at least triple the size. Budget sometimes speaks louder than the need itself. So, thank you for watching and uh, have a blessed day. Oh, and I just dropped a mini scope and guess what happened? The adapter which connects the standard oscilloscope cable broke and now I need a new adapter. As far as the multimeter, the multimeter is awesome, but it's very small and it's hard to see what's on the screen and Navigation is somewhat complicated because of the lack of buttons and the knob, but otherwise it's good. And the big boy is probably the best of them all, for a number of reasons, uh, but it's missing the trend for multimeter. I kind of wonder if they can run an update of the firmware and bring that feature back into the device at some point in the future. I don't know, so don't ask. Either way, I will give all three of these away and ship them anywhere in the US for free to the top three most voted comments. So if you want one, state your reason and ask the community to upvote your comment. First top voted comment will get the multimeter slash scope combo. Second top voted comment will get the mini scope with a broken adapter. And the third comment will get the multimeter. So and make sure that your YouTube account has some kind of email listed somewhere at least a temporary email, so I can contact you when when the time comes. Uh, the poll will last no more than three days after video is published, so hurry up. Goodbye.